Welcome to Core Women Live. Thank you for joining me. This is my opportunity to feature some very special guests where they talk about their goals, aspirations, challenges, resiliency, wisdom. Join me as I get the opportunity to talk to people about their journeys. Thank you. Hello, hello, and welcome to our viewers and to all my amazing guests here today for the Core Women Real Talk. Welcome. So, my name is Dr. Summer Watson, and I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce my guests. So, my guests are Sandy, Sandra Stowes and Mary Alex, who also goes by MA, Jen Fontania, and me, Summer. So, welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Can Hi. You hear me? Yeah, you sound great. We hear okay, you. great. So I'd like to do a quick introduction of my guests, starting down at Sandra Stowes. And Sandra is a retired U.S. Coast Guard, Vice Admiral, and the author of the book, Breaking Ice and Breaking Glass, Leading in, in Uncharted Waters. Again, these are very, very, very brief bios. Mary Alex, who also goes by MA, is the owner of Mary Alex Consulting, a LinkedIn consultant, and has worked for Microsoft, uh, who is the owner of LinkedIn as a community development specialist. We also have Jen Fontania, who is a speaker, author, certified money coach, who has worked with organizations such as the Walt Disney Company and Sony Studios, and she is the co-host of the Life, Love, and Money show with Summer and Jen. And then, of course, me, Dr. Summer Watson. I am an unlimited potential coach. I am a doctor of psychology, documentary film producer, producer of the Core Women podcast, and producer and co-host of the Life, Love, and Money show. Again, welcome. So, Hello. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is I'd like to go around the room real quickly and ask you to do a brief introduction. And we'll start with Sandy. Why do I always have to go first, Summer? <laughs> Story of my life. First, when I was a, a kid, I was raised with three brothers. I was the oldest. I was three years and 10 months when the fourth kid was born. I was always first for the hard stuff, last for the easy stuff. And then yeah. the Coast Guard, I was one of the first women to join uh, up in the Coast Guard Academy. I was in the third class that, that had women and ended up being the first uh, everywhere I went throughout my career. And now I'm the first to to give my little bit of a bio background and I'll leave it at that. I'm just honored to be with this, these remarkable women with you and Jen and Mary Alex. It's uh, quite a privilege to be here today and join you for this live talk. Thank you. Thank you. Mary, or yeah. M.A. rather, M.A. to yeah. tell us about yourself. I you feel the women power here, you know. Yes. Um, so yeah, uh, interesting theme, Sandy. I come from three brothers um, and a sister, big Irish Catholic family as well. And um, at a very unique uh, point in my career, um, having semi-retired from Microsoft and LinkedIn, I worked also for LinkedIn and um, now uh, already doing consulting for LinkedIn again um, as a semi-retired person and, um, uh, you know, just just loving life and loving connecting with women like this and and just just moving forward with you know chapter three awesome jen hello ladies hello everyone out there watching thank you for being here with us um i've been in the financial services world for over 16 years and also as a designer uh, that's another story but you know one of my passions today currently is um doing work with better wealth um, we endorse intentional living with our financial decisions. But my other other passion is uh, being a co-host with Miss Summer Watson. It's just like just she's so amazing and just excited to be here. Um, and so we have our group and the Life, Love and Money show that we do every week. And so that's just been a wonderful, wonderful um, thing that we've been working on. So super, super happy to be here to talk about this particular subject. So thank you all for being here. The subject is 2.0 Authentic and Meaningful Career Transitions. If you're here today, please, 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 we want to see your comments. We want you to be part of this conversation and we will respond. So let's just dive right into this. OK, so the first question is, how do we actually recognize and respond to inflection points in our life and career journey? Who wants to start? Anybody jump in? Whew. Well, 
Um, I'll I'll go first as as the, a, as the Mary Alex the A. Um, <laughs> I typically always go first. Long, you know, something hard or easy, Sandy. Um, so yeah, I think that one of the mantras, you know, somewhere that I do live by is there's always going to be a next chapter. And especially if you're a woman, because as we know, women, 49% of the workforce um, for women take a break, you know, be it having children, be it later on in your career, taking care of family. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to embrace that there's going to be chapter two, then there's going to even be potentially chapter three. And I think that once you embrace it, and you expect it, it's not quite as existentially riveting as people who think their career is just gonna go along one career track. And especially now with millennials and Generation Zs. I mean, what we know is that those two generations are even gonna jump around more in their careers than baby boomers. So I think, you know, to just expect as a woman, chapter two, three, and I've even seen four. Right. So. Yep. I think that's wonderful. Um, absolutely. And I want people to know that we can make change, career change, personal change at any point in our lives, any point in our lives. It does take courage, but a lot of times we just need to lean into that. And I know that's been said before, but to lean into it and what hasn't been, but I notice is being said more is feeling it, embracing it. Mm -hmm. and really standing in what that feels like and taking that deep breath to walk mm -hmm. forward and to really engage and make that change because it can be scary. Mm -hmm. We can doubt ourselves, but the change, we're making change every day. So if you look at it that way, we make change, our body changes, our mind changes, <laughs> our you know, there's a lot of things that change. So we can make change at any time in our lives. Anybody else? And I'll give a story maybe to illustrate it. A, a, an inflection point in my life. And uh, based on what Mary Alex and Summer have just said, I think uh, recognizing the opportunity to change when an inflection point creeps up on you. So how do you recognize that inflection point and embrace it instead of fighting it? And maybe most of us have a first impression to be sort of maybe comfortable where we are, even if the situation is not good, sometimes people are more comfortable where they are than striking out into the unknown. So they might not recognize an opportunity and be receptive to it, they might fear it. So when I was in the Coast Guard, I was in the Coast Guard for 40 years. So one might say, well, how could you ever have any career transition? Cause you were mm. in the same um, job for 40 years. No, every two years, maybe three, I would be reassigned to another unit. So I did do 12 years at sea and my main career path was what we call a float operation. So serving on different ships at sea, um, all the way from the Arctic to the Antarctic and down to the Caribbean. Um, I had a lot of um, different kinds of uh, sea duty, but I went to shore jobs in between. Each job I went to was different. There were some similarities. It was the Coast Guard, so the core values, uh, the missions, they didn't change, but the job that I was doing changed every single time I had to readapt, relearn, meet new people, and um, there came a time even when my career path, which was going to see um, the next opportunity, I'd been 12 years at sea at different points along the way. And there was one more um, size ship bigger that I could go to, which would have been the culminating, culminating point of my seagoing career. But something inside me said, am I really just destined to go back for another two years at sea? They do kind of the same thing I've been doing at sea, even though the jobs are a little different. One ship might do law enforcement, one ship might do icebreaking. You're still in that operating zone, or is there something else out there I'm meant to do? And so I thought, well, what do I um, love most about the sea? Is it the sunsets, you know, going up there and watching the sun go down, the stars come out in the middle of the ocean where no one else is around? Is it the adventure? And I thought, no, it's the people. It's looking down from the, the platform of the ship where you drive the ship from, which is the pilot house and looking down and seeing young people that have come out of um, recruit training, they're brand new in the Coast Guard. They don't really know what end of the ship to salute and they get in trouble because they are so unwise in the ways of the Coast Guard. But then two weeks later you get underway and now they're pulling on a line with confidence and, and um, they're developing as young men and women into the person that they are 
meant to be the best uh, that they can be. And I thought, I want to develop young people more so than I'm doing at sea. So I, I um, sent a, a letter in, which was very hard for me. It took a lot of courage to tell my assignment officer, no, I'm not going to ask to go to the next size ship. And they all wanted me to, because I would have been the first woman to, you know, command a bigger ship and that. I said, no, please send me to the Coast Guard's Recruit Training Center where all these new enlisted people graduate and go off to serve in all these ships at sea and all around the Coast Guard so I can train the next leaders of character. And I got that assignment and it was totally different than being at sea, way out of my comfort zone. It's like being the mayor of a small town with all the different components of training um, um, all the Coast Guard people that come in every year. Um, and then I realized that that was where I was supposed to be once I got past um, the um, concerns and challenges that I was going out of my path and maybe was risking my career success mm -hmm. by taking a different path at that stage. And it just set me on a path to then become superintendent of the Coast Guard Academy and then to go on to be um, a senior executive in the Coast Guard at the top levels. So that's a story that I would offer to people. Embrace that opportunity instead of being afraid and pushing it away. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Jen. Jen. Yeah, I love yeah, what Lucy said. Do you hear our feedback? I do. I don't know what it is. It's so strange. Oh, wait, it's gone now. Okay, so um, one thing I want to add is I, I love all this talk about change. I personally love change, which is usually not what I hear. And But I mean, look at who we have here this, this um, morning, afternoon, depending what time zone you're in. One of the things I want to encourage people is that when you have that opportunity, when you, when you are at that point and you see that, I think it's so important for us as women to allow ourselves that permission. I think so often I hear this dialogue about, well, I want to do this. I've been wanting, I've been dreaming. I wanted to, you know, there's a lot of that. And then there's this follow up with, yeah, but if I did that, and then there's these reasons why they can't whether it's because of a spouse, whether it's because of kids, whether it's something. And then it's almost like I'm witnessing somebody's dream dying. Right. They know they want to do it. And I think it's so important for us to realize at that juncture that take that opportunity, recognize it like we've been saying, but, you know, go for that change, but also give yourself that permission and not feel guilty about wanting to dream that, wanting to birth that project or whatever it is. Too often I'm seeing women going like, yeah, but you know, well, maybe one day. And that you know that one day isn't gonna come. And so mm -hmm. my, my encouragement in, in, in this whole conversation, in this particular question is to give yourself that permission that it's okay and you shouldn't feel bad about it. That when you are allowing yourself to step into those dreams, to step into that goal that you've been wanting to, really, really birth and make it come to fruition, imagine how much more powerfully you're gonna be able to show up for the world and how much better you're gonna be able to serve other people, your family. It's almost like look past where the current situation is and look past it so that you can realize if I can show up more for myself, I can do better for my family, for my spouse, for my kids, my community, whoever it is that you're trying to, to help and serve. And if you can look at that from that perspective, like give yourself that permission. I think we need to allow ourselves to be able to step into that choice and say, it's okay, I deserve this. I deserve this, especially when, you know, when Emmy was talking about chapter two, three, four and on, you get to this point where you're realizing, I got to do this now, it's now or never. And so you you have to step into that and embrace that change, embrace that opportunity, give yourself that permission because, you know, there's that point in time where you're going to look back and you're like, man, you know, I wish I did it. I never got to it. It would have been nice. And I always think about like, I don't ever want those kind of words to come out of my mouth. Right, right. Oh, love it, Jen. I love what everybody has said here, just with this one question. And I, I want to add to this because I think it's really important. Like Sandy had a story. And what I think people don't realize is in the military, although you have a 40 year career, you're always doing something different. And it takes courage to ask to do that something different. And it's a different culture. And here we are coming from all different backgrounds, culturally, age, you name it, careers, We've all been through transitions. So one of the questions that we have here from our viewers is, let me go, it was from one of our viewers and she said, how do we deal with 
kickback from family and friends? This is such a good question because when we are personally going through these changes, it already feels uncomfortable, but yet we're stepping into that discomfort, right? We're being our own, what I call disruptors, right? Positive disruptors. But here we are with a great question. How do we deal with kickback from family and friends? Because I know I felt that in the past, especially when, hey, you could be making, they said, you could be making such and such, but now you're going into this entrepreneurship and you're starting from zero. And I'm like, well, I'm not exactly starting from zero. And I, I felt like I was having to defend my position. How did, how have you felt that in any way ever? And how did you confront that? Or how did you deal with that? Anybody want to jump in? Yeah. <laughs> I'll go, because I'm thinking there, there were these, these distinct mm -hmm. moments I remember. So when I went to college, my initial intent was to be a doctor. <laughs> I laugh because if you're Filipino, you know, that's like the running joke. Like you you all start off as biology majors, eventually end up as psychology or something else. And so obviously I am not a doctor of medicine, but I, I do have a biology background. And so I remember there was a point in time I hadn't finished the undergrad degree yet. And I remember going to my parents and saying, I, I want to be a, a graphic designer. And they're just looking at me like, what are you doing? And so that was one moment. And then there was another moment when I transitioned into finance. And you are going to come up into those situations where whether it's friends, whether it's your partner, whether it's your parents, it, it doesn't matter. There's going to always be someone in your circle that might go against what you want. And for me personally, I will say it does it does sting. It does hurt. And you, you have to exercise that mindset, that muscle, where you eventually come to a place where you're just like, where, what, what is important to me? What is it that I want to do? And there, and it's not always an easy thing because I, I've seen throughout the years, people have this struggle, especially, you know, culturally and traditionally, depending on, you know, your, your background, there are going to be some cultures where you don't, you honor and you don't disrespect. And, and that unfortunately can become a very, very strong barrier to somebody fulfilling what they want to do. For me personally, I, again, kind of uh, piggybacking off we, what we just said in the last question, I come to a place where I'm like, whose life am I eventually going to live? I always think about, I'm a futurist. So I always think about like, how am I going to feel if I don't do this? And I don't care if I mess up. That's the key thing. I don't care if I mess up. I don't care if I fail because I know I'm just going to get back up and figure it out and go the other way and adjust. So I don't let that be the deterrent. I look more at, am I going to regret this? Because I see too many people again where they don't do what they want. They're trying to please everybody else. And it's, yeah, I get it. But at some point you have to honor yourself. You have to say, what is it that serves you? What is it that fulfills you? It is your life. You're only going to have one. And I don't want to get to a point way later down the road and go like, you know, I'm 85 now and let me go do those dreams. It's like, I, that's just not going to work for me. Is it is it easy to go against what other people want? Um, not always, because depending on your relationship with these people. And so sometimes I say, you know, there are going to be some people you're going to have to learn how to love from afar. It doesn't, it doesn't mean you write them off. It doesn't mean you hate them. It's just kind of like this boundary. Uh, Summer and I talk about that very often about boundaries and our core values. We talk about that all the time. And I, you know, I'm going to repeat it here. You have to know what those core values are and you have to believe that that's how you, you know, if you want to, you have to believe that's how you're going to base your philosophies and how you want to live your life. And you have to have that there so that you don't deviate from what it is that you want to do. And then you have to also give yourself that permission, but it is not easy all the time. You're gonna come up against opposition, but I embrace that. I embrace that and be like, okay, look it, I'm not trying to make everybody else happy. At the end of the day, again, like I said, if I can show up fully, I can do more. I can serve and help more, but that starts with me doing what I want to do, regardless if there are gonna be people who don't want to, who, who don't like what my decisions are. Right. And I'd like to pick up on that um, word you used, regret. And I mm -hmm. lived the life that you're talking about with um, being one of the first women to join up with a military academy and then being um, one of the first women to go here and there with mostly all men. Because I came into the Coast Guard in 1978 for context of your viewers. 
And I, when I started um, giving speeches, when I was superintendent of the Coast Guard Academy, responsible for a lot of young women and men, uh, students, cadets, who were looking to find their passion and purpose. They joined the Coast Guard. Where do they go? Lots of people giving them advice. <laughs> lots mm -hmm. of parent, lots of helicopter parents, yes. lots of coaches, teachers. Um, and, and who do you listen to? So I came across a book called The Five Regrets of the Dying by a palliative care nurse, Bonnie Rare. Um, I think that's her name, W-R-A-E. And uh, she said that listening to people on their deathbeds, that the number one regret of those who are dying is cho not choosing to do what th the life they wanted to live, but living the life somebody else expected of them. And I, that just hit me so hard. Oh, yeah. Because so many people who love me thought they knew what was best for me and wanted me to live a certain kind of life. And I was an unconfident, shy person. Makes it even harder. I had to believe in myself that no, I have this something inside me that's pulling me to do something different, to be true to myself. And I wasn't really happy or fulfilled or content, whatever word you prefer, until I learned to believe in myself and be true to myself, not to try to satisfy and please other people. I may. Yeah. Just to pivot off of these smart women before me, I'll say two things. Number one, I think that we need to be super careful when people project their own fears and anxiety mm. on us. And what I have found in my life is I have to really like sit with something that someone said to me that could have stung because and realize and really absorb that this could be their own fear, their own projection that has nothing to do with me. You know, and I think that's kind of our superpower, right? It is to, to sit on things, you know, and I will also talk about because I, not every pivot is something we choose. You know, there are certain chapters and things that happen in our careers that force us to go in a different direction. And I suspect maybe even for some of you and some of the folks, you know, listening in, you know, when you have 08 where the economy tanks, you know, or you have COVID, you have these catastrophic things that happen outside of our lives. And I think for me, one of those moments, those remarkable moments is, you know, when I decided after 20 years in the nonprofit sector where I ran nonprofits and big foundations that I wanted to transition, you know, into corporate America and, you know, and to a company like Microsoft, which was like a dream come true for me. But it took me literally taking a, a, pit, a move like that. And I literally made half the salary at first at Microsoft that I had made in the nonprofit sector because I had gotten to a certain, you know, higher plateau. So I had to also embrace, and I think we need to recognize these things that sometimes you make a pivot and it, you have to step back if you just assess success by money but yet, you know, if you're in the right milieu and if you have the right grooming and if you have grit, you know, you will make your way back up. But I think change can also be where you take a couple steps back, you know, and we need to recognize there's different types of change and pivots in our careers. And, you know, for me, and I'll give a little plug for LinkedIn. That's why, you know, with my clients, I always say to them, be ready you know like have that linkedin profile up to par because you never know it's like all relationships in life you never know what's next for you you never know if there's going to be a covid or the tanking of the stock market or a million other x you know things outside of ourselves that could hit us hard in our careers and so you know that's part of my mantra in life of working with women is keep that LinkedIn going, you know, don't be caught off guard. Yeah, I love that. So many really great points and Emmy, great points there. Yeah, a lot of times we don't expect certain things. So be, even in law school, when I went to a brief stint of law school, they said, really think about it as a meteor coming out of the sky and what are you gonna do? Think of all of your options, left, right, front, back, you know, think about what you're gonna do right away. Mm -hmm. And so the MA, great points. You know, I want to talk, I want to touch on a couple of things that you all have brought up. So how do you have this conversation? There's one book 
from a woman who's actually doing a TEDx talk today in Santa Barbara. Her name is Melody Stanford Martin, and she actually wrote the, the book Brave Talk. And so this is a great book about talking, talking about those, those tough, having those tough conversations. I cannot wait to dive into this book. Another thing that uh, Jen touched on that we always touch on, core values. We always go into these companies asking, what are your mission? What are your values? What are you? But have you thought about what your own core values are? Have you sat with that and thought, what is meaningful to me? How do I live my life? By what values do I live my life? There's a mantra, there are core values for the military, for each, each section of the military. There, there, there's a mission for LinkedIn and there are values for LinkedIn. There's a mission for you, Jen, as an entrepreneur. There's a mission for me. But have you thought about what your own personal mission is, your own core values? Now, you're sit now we're here, these four strong women, and we're talking about change and we're talking about courage and we're talking about, and that's incredible. But what happens, and I want, let me take a step back. I want you to know that we've all had that point of fear. We've all had that moment of, in many moments, of questioning ourselves. We may not have called it imposter syndrome back in the 80s or the 90s or the 70s, but we all felt at one point, how did I get here? Do I belong here? And sometimes you just have to stand in that and go, yes, I do. I belong here. But what am I going to have my journey look like? What do I want my journey to look like? It's funny that you say we don't always choose, right, M.A.? But I find that one of our superpowers is choice. One of our superpowers is choice. And how do we go forward making those choices? How do we choose to do A, B, or C? And what is that going to look like for us? So I would say when people, to answer our, the question that this viewer asked, when we think about these choices, come to the table with, your script, understanding your values. So when you do have these brave conversations, these tough conversations, you know exactly why you're making these changes. Are there going to be changes within those changes? Absolutely. Are we going to make missteps? Absolutely. Because we're human. And by the way, missteps are some of the best steps we can take because there's so much wisdom gained. Yeah. So with that said, I'm, let's move on to our next question because I think we've kind of answered this, but I want to ask it, ask it anyway. But what holds us back from achieving our full potential and how can we break down those barriers? So I can give a little bit of just a, a one liner because I know we have talked a bit about this, but yes, we have. breaking down barriers. So we did talk about overcoming obstacles and perceptions that other people might have of us, but breaking down barriers might be a different topic and we might not have answered that summer. So I do think that's a good thing because there's certainly the barriers that we, the barriers we set for ourselves, mm -hmm. the other, the barriers other people set for us and the barriers we find in the institutions we're working in, whether it's a nonprofit or a private sector or the military, and then the barriers society might still have in place. So I guess there's four levels of barriers. The personal ones, that's what you, barriers you have and other people who around you have, the institutional barriers and the societal barriers. So breaking those barriers down through cultural change, through access, giving everybody equal opportunity, equal access, changing cultures to make everyone feel welcome so yes. that they do believe they belong there, right? Right. How do you believe you belong somewhere if you don't feel like it because nobody looks at you when you walk in the office or you don't have any friends and no one makes any effort to welcome you. Right. Absolutely. Great points. You know, really, and this is something that's really being talked about right now. Inclusion, diversity, equity. What does that look like? You know, so that looks different for each of us, that looks different for each of us going into certain companies or how we start a business. And how do we, how do we break down those barriers? How do we lift other people up? And I think, you know, one of the things I'm gonna mention really quickly is mentorship, like bringing somebody in, mentoring folks. Um, it's really something that's important to me. Also being courageous and taking those first steps and speaking up and finding a network to really create those discussions around like we're doing today. Yeah, yeah. To add to that, I would love 
what I really enjoy in life is putting myself around the diversity of ages. Like, I think we talk a lot about diversity of color, ethnicity, et cetera. But I love being around people from the diff from different generations. I think each of us bring, of course, unique perspectives. Um, you know, and I'm I'm I one thing moving to Microsoft was that I put myself in a milieu of like mostly younger people. And at first, admittedly, I, I couldn't find my sea legs to talk like Sandy. I couldn't find my sea legs. Um, but I eventually found it and really embraced that they were teaching me as much as I was them, even though my career had been much more extensive by that point. Right. Yes. And that was a brave move. And so how did that feel for you, MA, when you went into that company? Did that, did you feel, did you feel that block or that, that wall of sorts? How did you feel? How did you work through that? How did you embrace it? Yeah, I, I admittedly a little bit, a little bit rough at the beginning, and um, but I think I realized that I had as much to teach, and I had a certain openness and agility to myself where they could feel my authenticity in wanting to learn more from them. Certainly because I embrace social media and technology. I feel like I shared that with them, but they were, you know, they were always one step ahead of me, but I was open to learning. You know, I'm not a woman who, ha who has aged and feared technology. And I think certain people can get into that and it really dates you and ages you and keeps you from being around different generations of women when you have such a wall built up about what's coming down the pike, which is technology, technology, and more technology. There's no way of stopping it. And I just, I feel like as you can embrace those things as you age, be it through athleticism, intellectual, academia, whatever sector you're in, you know, the better outcome you're gonna have is to, you know, continue to move forward, continue to learn. And nope. not be like, again, technology is the speed of light. And, and if, if people, at, regardless of age, need to continue to embrace it. I mean, LinkedIn changes every single day. <laughs> right, right. Jen. One thing I want to throw, can I throw something out? Sure, here, sure. Please? Absolutely. Mary Alex, for the viewers, because we all know about each other's bios, but Mary Alex has swum the English Channel. Oh, she no. Oh, man, no, no, no. to keep herself fit yes. and able to relate. So she makes the effort. And I think the, oh. the just to piggyback on is it just doesn't happen by sitting in your chair. You've got to make mm -hmm. a conscious effort to um, to defy your age and to look for youth to bolster you. That's why I loved commanding our Coast Guard's enlisted mm -hmm. accession source and our Coast Guard officer accession source, the academy, because I surrounded myself with young people and that helped me to be a better, more diverse leader who could appeal and uh, relate to and therefore better lead people of all ages. Oh yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I'm so thankful that you mentioned that about MA and Sandy, you know, even while you were in the military, you train like a athlete. So, and then after, you know, you do your own swims and you still stay physical. So there's so many things, so many bar barriers we are breaking here as, as women over the decades, over, over time. And just personally, we personally have broke barriers as you said in your book, Sandy. So let's move forward just a tad because we have so many questions to cover here and we're getting a lot of great feedback. Then I do want to answer some of our viewers' questions. But the next question is, you already mentioned this, MA, but how do we try and combat the ageism that for women in their careers starts at 35 when we may want to also reinvent ourselves? So starts at 35, we begin to see these transitions and these phases that we personally are going through with our body, our minds, you know, our careers, we're doing some introspection at that point, you know, we're in the midst of maybe having the children and we're looking at our lives and saying, what is it that we want? But how is our, how is society? How are these career paths? How are these people going to embrace us? How do we start breaking these things down and reinventing ourselves? How do we take those small steps? 
are they big leaves? But I like what you said, Sandy, early on. It just doesn't happen by sitting in a chair. So. Mm -hmm. I'll, jump in here. I'll jump in here. Okay. So for me, um, you know, I, I've always been around change, uh, but also always been very welcoming of it. And so for me, I look at it from the perspective of adventure. I look at it like, oh, this is so exciting. I'm gonna figure it out. And I know not everybody's like that. Um, but one of the things I've seen in other women that were more mature and then they were reinventing themselves. And I'm talking people that decided to change something that they've been in for 40 years, 30 years. And, then the, and they're like, you know what? I know I'm 58 or I'm 60 or, or whatever it is. And it was so inspiring to see that they were scared, but they didn't care. And they just continue to push forward. And I see their stories, especially on social media. I see them embracing technology. I see them getting help. And I love what Emma said. And, and even Sandy, you said this to an extent. When you surround yourself with different ages, when you surround yourself with different people in different stages of their life, like you gain so much perspective, you gain so much more wisdom because you're, and I look at it like bookends. Um, and I, I think, you know, to, at the, the company I'm with at Better Wealth, we, we, I'm like the oldest there, one of the oldest, if you can believe that. I'm surrounded by these brainiacs, these, these millennials that are geniuses. And it's so interesting because we have this mutual respect where we do have other advisors and people that we look up to that are more seasoned, that have been in the industry for 30 years. But yet our founder is 25. The CEO is 25. He just turned 25. It's crazy. He looks like he's 14. But it's like so amazing to see like we all have this respect for each other to learn from one another. And we get inspired like, wow, you got this experience. And then we look, wow, you bring a fresh perspective that we, we've trained advisors that have been in the industry for over 20, 30 years. And they are learning from these millennials how to do things differently. And so when I see people surround themselves with different experiences, different ages, there's this inspiration that people have. And even when I look at these women that are, are going through that second transition, they they know it's scary. They know it's a new stage, but they their goal is so big. They are ready for it. That's what I've seen. They're ready for it. They, they've put so many things in their life on hold, sacrificed so much for their family, for their kids, for their spouses, especially if you've been a spouse that allowed your spouse to uh, you know let them do their career. And then they come to this point, and I know some are you've spoken about this. It's kind of like, it's yeah. my turn. It's my yeah. turn. And so, I mean, I just think when these women have this drive within them, and like they're unstoppable. And that's what I've seen take place where they are just so ready. It's just, it's they realize they come to this moment in their time where like, it's my turn. And just to see that is so inspiring because it's like, you, you, you're almost like, you're just totally cheering them on because you're like, yes, you can totally do this. And age does not become this factor anymore. And I think because of technology, a lot of things have just been flattened. There is like the curves are the, the, the curves that were there before these boundaries and these barriers that we're talking about. I feel like they're flattening more and more as the generations work together and learn from one another, as well as everybody embracing technology to, to work in our favor. Oh, fantastic. Oh my goodness. Great input. Yeah. I think that you had mentioned Jen, and I'm going to go back to this certain at certain points in our lives, like my life, I really, and I'm going to tell you a little story here. When I think about my life, I thought, you know, when I was growing up, I had a mom who was really embracing. She said, Summer, you can do whatever you choose to do. You can really just, what I want you to do is be happy. I want you to choose to be happy in whatever you decide to do. That message, that foundation helped me so much along my path because I always went back to that and thought, okay, even if I make a misstep, I can try again, but I, I choose to be happy. I'm choosing to be happy. So here's the thing. I always thought I would be that, that woman with the corner office, the windows, you know, going up, having the trajectory of being that a tiger lady, right? Like here I am, hear me roar, right? And being some kind of something, a doctor or this, a lawyer perhaps. And I did go to law school. And at that point, when I did go to law school, I made the, the, the decision not to continue because it didn't align with my values. I then ended up getting married seven years after meeting my boyfriend in my senior year of high school. When I did, that changed my journey because he joined the Marine Corps. 
So I had to learn about a new subculture, the Marine Corps. How was I going to function in the Marine Corps? Because I had already had a degree. I knew that I wanted to be a professional of some sort. I had already went to a bit of law school at that point. So when he joined, he joined a little bit older. He was a little older. He was about 23, 24. And so he went enlisted and then eventually went through the officer billet. And so he got he got to, you know, kind of experience that whole enlisted working with young folks and then going on to the officer billet. However, for me, every time we moved, I had to move my career. And yet I got my master's degree. I got my PhD. I still moved overseas with my husband. But at the end of his career, I looked at myself and thought, what is it that I want to do with myself now? Because I didn't want to do the, I didn't want to be in that same trajectory of like moving, moving, hospital, hospital. I want to work in a hospital. I want to work in a hospital. That's not what I wanted anymore. So what was I going to do? So I had to really step back and think about this. But it didn't necessarily mean re, totally reinventing myself. Because I had already gained all these incredible super skills. Because something that I didn't do is I wasn't stagnant. I didn't stay in one place and just follow this person that I loved. Yes, I loved him. Yes, I embraced his, his choice to be in the military, but I also needed to maintain my own values and what I envisioned for myself and what did that look like. So I wanted to say that because the next question is, it's going into my next question, does rebranding ourselves mean starting over or applying our super skills in a different way? And I believe that in that, ex that example that I gave, uh, all those years of following my husband, those 21 years, I created super skills, both innate and learned. Or, so I was able to apply those when I made the choice to be an entrepreneur. What about you? So with the question, does branding ourselves mean starting over or applying our super skills in a different way? Anybody want to jump in here? I would, I, I mean, go ahead. I would say it's really both. Like it, it has to be both, right? Because with every, you know, with every risk, you know, there's there's something that can be gained and, and something that can be lost. And I think what we're finding in the working world today is the power of soft skills. You know, like not that education isn't important, you know, and some of your pivoting can be about the education that you acquired, like you talked about earlier, Summer. But what we're recognizing more and more, and again, what LinkedIn really does a good job of is projection, you know, of your values, your soft skills, you know, like even, you know, Generation Z folks, what do we know? We know that they want to match their, their values, their core values with the company that they work for. That wasn't true, you know, of two and three generations before them. But now, you know, what we're realizing is soft skills, intrinsic values, you know, how you feel about the employer is as important and has to align with your values. You know, so I think I think we're talking about soft skills, which are getting much more visibility in the media megaphone than they ever did in the past. And in conjunction with your education and hard skills that we learn. But I, I think I think a lot of success, you know, is soft skills and being able to sell yourself right and no matter what job i always love when i work with clients and they're and they say they don't want to go into sales i'm like everything is sales you're selling yourself every day no matter what milieu you're in no matter what sector no matter what relationship you're selling yourself every day and i think for some people that's hard to sit with but it's absolutely true you know people even the best technologists in the world the ones that are really excelling have some unique soft skills and their personalities are inviting. Absolutely. I, I want to piggyback on what you said there, M.A. I absolutely believe that is true because I see that in the coaching field all of the time. People begin to coach just based off of those soft skills and their experiences. And yet, you know, there are people like me who are bringing in that experience, that professional background as well as those soft skills you know so i see that quite a bit in in the the coaching spectrum as well so and that is like you said it is gaining visibility it really is so anybody else want to contribute to that question 
I just want to, before we, um, I'll continue, so, but um, Bibiana um, has a question. She says, um, and this is when MA was speaking, what do you mean by soft skills? So if you can just elaborate on that, that would be great. On what soft skills are? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think for me, soft skills are about being able to engage with people. It's being able to get along with the team. I think one big component um, of soft skills is humility. And I think we don't talk about humility enough, but bringing other success forward, you know, learning in life that you rarely got to where you're at without other people, you know, and, and, you know, like the, the, the pushing of other people of you, other people bringing out the best parts of your personality. You know, I think soft skills are more about I code or, you know, I sell blah, blah, blah for a living. But I think that, that the soft skills are more about interpersonal and interpersonal skill sets, you know, that, that advance you in your career. And what do we know? We know that the most successful people also generally know how to get along with other people and they're liked, right? We're, we're humans. We want to be liked and we want to like other people. And a lot of that is learning how to accentuate and expand your soft skills. Absolutely. I think those are really great points. I love what you said about humility. I love what you said about, we don't do it on your, our own. We absolutely don't do it on our own. And that's why I think when Sandy mentioned that she loved working with younger folks, giving them, you know, providing them, helping them with their foundation, understanding what it means to understand your own core values, how to harness those super skills or those even those soft skills, and what that looks like and doing that mentorship. We've all done it. Jen's done it. Sandy's done it. MA's done it. I've done it. And I think that it's something that's really critical is to be a mentor and give back to our community and be a model, a model. And I also believe that you know, when we talk about this and starting over applying our super skills, it goes back to me so many times the issue of core values. Core values are so important at understanding what they are. I tell people this all the time because it is your launching point. It's where you launch from. It's what you're going to see in regards to the longevity of your job, because if your values align with the job that you're looking for, you're going to be there a little bit longer. You're going to appreciate the job. It also goes to speak to uh, your partnerships, your friendships, the people that you pair with, you choose to pair with in life. Core values are essential and understanding what those are and what those look like and how you live in congruence with those is essential. And I talk about that in my own book. It's got a funny title, F yeah, get real with strong language, but I talk <laughs> about that in, I know. <laughs> you want it? I like it. But I just, thank you. But it, it's got, you know, here it is, folks. But it, what it does is it really talks about the strategy of understanding your core values. And I really think that's our launching point. And I think we've all been through it. We've all talked about it. We've all touched on it during this conversation about your own core values and what worked for you once you were clear about what your core values were and, and walking in alignment with those values. So I know we've got a couple of more questions, but I do want to get to our last couple of questions. So, and we've got about 12 minutes and I think this is going to take us into our 12 minute mark. And we might even have to have a second part of this because this is so <laughs> great, but you know, um, and we talked about some of the obstacles that we face when going through major career transitions. We've talked about that. Um, how do we use and apply our super skills or our capabilities? What do those look like? So really what I'd like to get to now is a question that Mary came up or MA came up with early on. What are the mantras that we use to live more full lives and reach our potential to be in our personal and professional life? What are those mantras? What are those things that carry us that we wake up each day thinking about and carry us through the day or even through our lives? Anybody? I'll, I'll, I'll share. Oh, I'll share uh, two of them that I think about a lot. Um, I don't know if I'd call them a mantra, but um, one is everything is fixable within times. Ooh. And then the second one is done is better than perfect. 
Mm. And I think when I think about those things, it uh, you know, we talked about permission at the beginning of this conversation. And I think when we can create that personal space, that bubble within our own mindset, you tend to look at, or I, I look at things differently where it's okay to mess up. It's okay. I am going to mess up. I live on earth. You know, I'm human. I'm going to totally mess things up, but being okay with that. I think too often, you know, and I'm, I'm a recovering perfectionist, trust me. So, you know, I, I, I have to, you know, my father is a retired mechanical engineer. It's just so funny because in all the projects I do now, there's this rule that we, I go by. It's like 80%. 80% is good enough. I'm not building a rocket ship. 80% is good enough because there were times when I would have that perfectionism get in the way. But mm -hmm. when you have that, it stops you from making that progress that it was good enough and it's okay. And so when I would study other entrepreneurs, when I would study other business owners, especially like the, the, the big ones that have made it really far and they're billionaires, you read about what they did and how they did it. And it wasn't always about being perfect. It was embracing that mistake. It was about embracing that change. It was about embracing like, I don't know how this is going to work out. And so I got comfortable with that. And so not having it at 100% and being okay with 80 and knowing that if it fails, knowing that doesn't work out, I'm going to be okay with that and not beat myself up because you can always change. And I look at those things as choices. If it goes that way, that's okay. Whatever I did before that got me there, I also will have the choice to change how that is going to end. Hmm. And look at it like that. And everything I talk about is always about shifting your perspective and your mindset. And it just makes things easier because you're looking at it with a different lens versus being worrying versus being like over critical and, and just so hard on yourself. It's not a good place to operate in. And so those two, those two mantras gives me permission like, hey, it's okay. It doesn't work out. That's okay. We just adjust. We just adjust. It's kind of like your GPS recalculating, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. And so you, you know, it's, it, 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 it just makes life so much easier to go through when you can look at it like that because you're operating from a different vibrational frequency of hope, inspiration, love versus me being anxious and worried and angry. Oh, I failed. Oh, I suck. Oh, I can't make it. It is all about mindset for me. Now we can see why Jen is such a sought after speaker. Oh my goodness. <laughs> awesome. And I uh, must admit, I was thinking about that word mantra and it's a little bit of a, I don't know, when I hear the word mantra, nothing comes to mind. But when you started to say the failure and embracing that uh, and getting to an 80% solution instead of chasing perfection all the way for the rest of your life, I thought about um, what that means to me. And I always tell people, fail forward fail forward while you're stretching for a goal to reach for something new to innovate a new solution to discover mm -hmm. something and then you're falling flat on your face and you can pick yourself up push up like that's why you have to do your push-ups so you can push up after all the failures <laughs> but another thing that's a mantra i've, I've embraced that word now is um mm -hmm. life's about the journey not the destination and that comes from mm -hmm. one of my favorite books uh by Cervantes, Don Quixote, and Don Quixote said that during the book, because the book um, Don Quixote is all about the journey that Don Quixote takes in life. And it involves all kinds of opportunities and failures. And um, there's a quote in there, life is about the road, not the inn. So the journey you're taking on that road of life, it can have potholes, it can have barricades, it can have snow that you can't get through, water hazards. And life is not about the inn where you're sleeping in a comfortable bed. It's about being out on the road, a sea, on a ship, you call it, I called it, cold, wet, hungry, tired, and scared. Sometimes all five of those at once. <laughs> and that's the road of life, that's the journey. And that's where we find fulfillment. And there's a trend nowadays that I've heard, and I nearly hate it when I hear these interviews and podcasts and blogs, about how, oh, we're all pushing each other to work too hard nowadays. We all need to back off and not work hard and um, let it go. And I'm like, no, you're not going to find fulfillment unless you're challenging yourself in a just cause, in a purposeful cause every day. That's where you're going to find personal fulfillment, which transcends um, happiness, which is fleeting. 
you should be looking for deep fulfillment that comes from the satisfaction that comes from pushing yourself as far as you can on that road. Mm -hmm. That's oh, thank you so much for that mantra and your thoughts, Ma. Yeah, what how I will respond to this question is something um, a study that was done, and if anybody wants to email me, <clears throat> I can certainly provide this resource. There was a study that was done of all the a number of top military officers and they said to them very simply what's the most important relationship in your life we're going to let you go away for 24 hours and we want your responses when you come back and these people were successful on every measure every measure in life and the conclusion was which should be no surprise the relationship you have with yourself is by far the most you know deep it's going to deter it's going to determine so much more of your life like how you feel about yourself will play out far more than any anybody else's projection of who you are in life and i think that you know sometimes that's that's hard for us to hold on to but it is about what we tell ourselves you know our self doubts you know like what gets in our way and how we overcome them and i I, I that for me is is something I, I I try and keep in my forebrain that it's what I'm telling myself that is by far the most important relationship I have. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Emma, for that. And I would just add to all of this incredible wisdom, because my last question was gonna be, you know, what are your words of wisdom? And we kind of already touched on all of this by by using this question regarding the mantra, but my words of wisdom and my mantra, there's so many. <laughs> and Jen, I laugh because Jen knows a lot of them, but values. Understand your values. That's key. That is so key. The next one is we hold the key to our success. If you're if you're standing here right now and you're comparing yourself to any one of us, don't. Don't don't compare. Comparison is really difficult, and it it it, it's, it it stops you. It can stop you in your tracks. What you can do though is pick things that we've talked about to apply to your life and say, "Oh, that might work for me." Because each of us, our process is different, and I think it's so important to recognize that when we go to compare, we are not we are comparing something that doesn't have the same factors that we're dealing with in our own lives. So our process is naturally gonna look different. So know that, stop the comparison, you know, take on this information that's gonna apply to your life, uh, put it into your process that works for you. I'm all about understanding process and your own process. You wanna stand, you wanna understand your own process and what that looks like for you because that's gonna look different for Jen. It's going to look different for MA and different for Sandy. And it looks different for me. So understand your process and know that you have the superpower and the superpower is choice. You have the choice to do something with yourself, your life and your journey. I want to thank each and every one of you that have been watching and each of the people that have been part of this conversation, Jen, MA, Sandy, what I'd like you to do really quickly, if we could, before we end here, because we've got two minutes, but tell people how they can reach you, where they can reach out if they want to talk to you and connect. Jen, you want to start? Sure. I mean, you can easily find me on social media. You can either find me on Facebook or Instagram, and that's at Jen Money Coach. Um, and I will type that in the in the chat, and then I will do the same for MA and, and, and Sandy as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks. M.A.? Oh, I bet you can guess what mine is. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm totally a, a, in a prolifically on LinkedIn. And um, for me, it is the social media tool. And so, you know, please go there. And anybody that's listening today, and you guys are already my first degree connections, but, you know, I encourage you to tap in and connect. And you never know where relationships are going to go. That's right. And I'm on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Mostly the predominant is LinkedIn. And you can find me at www.sandrastowes.com. And that's my website. It's got um, all the information on how to buy my book or to get to my blog. I have a weekly blog called Leading with Character, accessible through that website. 
And Sandy, can you tell people where they can find your book, Breaking Ice and Breaking Glass Leading into Uncharted Waters? Right there on the website under the tab book. <laughs> and on Amazon, on her website. And you can find me, of course, on Core Women, on Instagram at Core Women, at the Life, Love, and Money Show with Summer and Jen on Instagram. You can find this. There will be a replay, hashtag replay of this on the Core Women YouTube page. So if you missed any part of this, please check this out on our on the core women youtube page okay i want to thank all of you for being here today thank you so much you're such wise women and i've had such fun thank you again thanks thank ladies you. thanks everyone thank you all.